Republican Jewish coalition. He criticized the Obama administration's handling of Iran, Russia, and the Israeli-Palestinian peace negotiations. He also challenges the president's record on the economy and other domestic issues. From Las Vegas, this is about 45 minutes. And uh, looking forward to your questions. I have more of a uh, conversation in mind uh, this morning as opposed to a speech. I, I did put some notes down, so I'm going to refer to them from time to time, but I'd like to get your perspective on some issues, and I'll share my perspective as well. But I first want to say thank you to you for hosting um, this event and bringing such a, an esteemed group of people together. Uh, thank you to uh, Chairman Flum for his leadership and Matt Brooks for his extraordinary leadership as well. Uh, thank you to the Adelsons for opening up their home. Not a bad place you have here, uh, uh, Sheldon. This is pretty nice. And Miriam, you do a nice job here. Thank you. What an extraordinary uh, uh, contribution this couple has made uh, to Jewelry around the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks to the RJC for the, the work you're doing to elect uh, conservatives across the country. We had a good November. Uh, and to a great degree, uh, thanks to the RJC and, and like-minded people across this country who said they wanted to see real change in Washington, you, you guys made it happen. And, and we Republicans are flying high because Nancy Pelosi is flying coach. This is, uh, <laughs> this is very good news. <laughs> Now, now, there are a number of people in this room who were extraordinarily helpful to me during my campaign uh, to run for president last time around, and, uh, and you know, Sam is, is one of those, and, and of course, uh, Ambassador Assembler here. I, I see a whole series that Shelley came with many people who are, were part of that team. I want to say thank you to you. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get the job done. I wanted to become the nominee, but of course, had I become the nominee, then I'd have been the guy that lost to Barack Obama. Uh, I, that, that's not necessarily written in stone, but by goodness, it was a very difficult time. And when the economy got in real trouble, why, it was very, very hard for Republicans. But boy, we have come back in a massive way, thanks to your leadership and, and, and your effort. Now, I, uh, I also saw a number of you at the tribute uh, about a week ago in Washington, D.C., at the Kennedy Center for George Herbert Walker Bush and his contribution to volunteerism through the Points of Light Foundation. You, a number of you were there. Uh, if you weren't there, it was on TV last Monday. Uh, and if you watched it, you saw there were a number of country performers there. I like country music. I'm not uh, an extraordinary fan. I can't tell you all the artists, but I, I do have some favorites. I began humming during that event a song that I used to remember by, I think it was Kenny Rogers, uh, You Picked a Fine Time to Leave Me, Lucille. Remember that song? I, uh, for those that don't know it, the, 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 uh, the refrain is, You picked a fine time to leave me, Lucille, with four hungry children and a crop in the field. You, pick a you picked a fine time to leave me, Lucille. And, and I say that because given all that's been happening in the world, the tumult in the world, uh, given the fact that our economy was collapsing, we picked a fine time to pick as our president a man who has no experience in the private sector, no experience in negotiation, no experience really in leadership, and, uh, and the consequence of seeing someone learn another job in the presidency has not been a pretty sight. And, and what... Uh, And, and that has been true both in foreign policy and in domestic policy. And, and it, let me just step back for a moment. We, we have had, since President Truman, a pretty consistent foreign policy as a nation. President Truman and Dean Acheson, following the Second World War, said, look, we've got to rethink American foreign policy. And Dean Acheson, in his book, Present at the Creation, described what was a newfound uh, vision for America's foreign policy. It had a number of elements, but three of these uh, were the following. One we would be involved in the world. We, we would not be isolationist. We would be involved because we had found that by being isolationist to a certain degree, that we had been drawn in to the conflicts of the world at great loss. Secondly, we would promote our values. We would promote freedom and opportunity, free enterprise and free trade and human rights. We would promote those things we believed in because we found... We had found that those nations that, that had adopted those principles tended to be more peaceful. And finally, we would be strong. We would acknowledge that there were good guys and bad guys, that we'd understand that there was evil in the world, that some people had as their, their intention to oppress others. And so we recognized that we would be strong and we would link our arms with our friends around the world as allies, because together we could be stronger than any one nation could be alone. That's been the, the, the foundation of America's foreign policy for a long time. Now, when the president came into office, 
The question was, would he adhere to that foreign policy that had been in place through, well, since the 1940s? And, and the first test, interestingly, that comes to my mind was in, uh, was in Honduras, where the Supreme Court there said the pro-Marxist, pro-Chavez, anti-American president had violated their constitution, and therefore he should be removed. The military removed him. And then President Obama insisted he get put back in office. Think what that message was around the world. And of course, with Colombia in, in South America as one of our best allies in, in opposing Chavez, he gives a straight arm to the, the special trade relationship which, which Colombia is seeking. And then, then you have, uh, of course, you have what happened with, with uh, dissident vo voices taken to the streets of Iran. Instead of standing up immediately and cheering these voices that are seeking freedom and change there, he had nothing to say. So the world recognized that instead of promoting these values in an aggressive, dynamic way, he was going to be silent, at least in some circumstances. And then it went on to a question about uh, the, uh, the extent of our solidarity with our allies. Would we link arms with our allies and beat them up in private if we disagreed, but to the world stand with our arms linked? And that was evidenced in his inaugural address at the United Nations, where the President chastised our best ally in the Middle East, Israel, castigated Israel for building settlements and had nothing to say about Hamas launching thousands of rockets into Israel. Think what message that sends. People ask, is it better to be a friend of America or a foe of America? And of course, then he won the Nobel Peace Prize as part of this whole process. <laughs> and I think that was in part because of an assessment that he, that he was going to engage Iran and engage with North Korea and Syria. We'd have this engagement policy and reach out to them. How's that worked out, by the way? Um, <laughs> Uh, think of that. North Korea sunk a South Korean ship, shelled a, an island, South Korean island, uh, launched long-range missiles, uh, did a nuclear test, and of course Iran continues to arm and fund Hezbollah and Hamas and, uh, and presumably the Taliban as well, uh, supporting the, the insurgents, the Yemeni insurgents, uh, and is pursuing their own nuclear folly. It has not worked out terribly well. It, uh, it seems to me that he is following an unusual belief. It's a sense that, and he said it in a speech or two, that we all have common interests. And, and there's probably a sense in which that makes uh, a certain degree of logic. But I don't think he understands that not all the leaders of the world have common interests, or all the people of the world have common interests. In fact, some people want to oppress other people, and exploit other people, and kill other people. We're not like them, and we don't have common interests with them. We have interests with people who seek and love freedom. Now, in my own view, one of the most distressing uh, uh, products of, of this wandering foreign policy was, uh, was the, uh, the engagement with Russia. As you recall, he wanted to reset relations with Russia. Russia has been, for some time, our, our number one geopolitical um, adversary. They're not an, a, an enemy, but, but when there's a matter of geopolitical significance, they tend to line up on the other side and try and pull people together with them. And they have had as their number one objective for a long time the removal of our missile defense system from Eastern Europe. This president decided to give them that. Now, he could explain all the reasons he wanted to do it, but had he been an experienced negotiator, he'd recognize that even if you want to give the, the person across the table from you exactly what they want, you don't tell them that up front. Yeah. In, instead, you think about what you want, and you get something in return. Instead, he gave them their number one objective our number one adversarial uh, player on the geopolitical stage gave them their number one uh, goal. And what did he get in return? What, what could he have gotten? He could have gotten, I believe, a commitment on their part to say we will not veto crippling sanctions against Iran for their nuclear program. That's what he should have done. That's what experience would have done. And of course, now we have the tumult in the Middle East, and uh, uh, it's hard to read where that's going to go. Uh, this could either be one of the most positive developments in the history or the last 50 years of the Middle East with, uh, uh, with nations embracing modernity or coming to grips with modernity and seeking more representative forms of government, or it could be one of the worst things that has happened in the last 50 years with nations uh, turning towards uh, uh, radical, violent uh, Islamic jihadism. And, uh, and America should have a lot to say and, and, and a great effort in how, in how that develops. But I, I must admit I was distressed by hearing our Secretary of State uh, characterize Mr. Assad as a reformer. Th this is not a good start. 
Uh, and, uh, and, and America must devote our intellectual and personal and diplomatic resources to help move these nations towards modernity and provide for greater stability and ultimate peace in, uh, in, in that part of the world and, of course, in, in the entire world. I, I'd also tell you that I think the President's inexperience in negotiations contributed to uh, less than, than positive developments on the Israeli-Palestinian negotiating front. Uh, now, why do I say that? Well, my guess is that the President came out and was critical of Israel, in part because he wanted to show the Arab world and the Palestinians in particular that he was impartial, that he was a neutral party. Now, I know from negotiating, that's not how you start. You want the people around the table to know who you're going to stand by. You're with them, you're locked arms, they're your friend, your, they're your ally, you will not vary from them. But instead, he said, hey, look, I'm going to be critical of Israel. I'm going to be tougher on settlements than the Palestinians are. And, and by doing that, he had the predictable but unintended consequence of convincing the Palestinians that they could probably get a better deal imposed by America on Israel than by negotiating with Israelis. Or perhaps by having America stand on the sidelines at the UN as a, as a settlement of some kind was imposed by other nations of the world. And so the Palestinians were perhaps a little less anxious to sit down at the negotiating table, particularly with, with Prime Minister Netanyahu, in part because the President was so critical of the Prime Minister that they wondered whether we might try and push him out of office. At the same time, you, you think, what was the impact on the, on, the, on the mind of the Israelis as they were negotiating? Well, they'd say, gosh, you know, we've had some bad experience uh, ceding territory. To, to others. When we pulled out of southern Lebanon, uh, Iran quickly moved in, and now rockets are, are, have been fired from southern Lebanon. As we pulled out of Gaza, Iran rapidly moved in through their, their surrogates, of course, Hezbollah and Hamas, and rockets are being fired from Gaza. And so if we pull out from the West Bank, which just happens to almost surround, nearly surround on three sides, um, uh, Jerusalem, and is, of course, within a stone's throw, and certainly a rocket's launch uh, from Tel Aviv, they recognized, gosh, this could be very, very dangerous, existential, in fact, to just hand over the West Bank. And so the only way we'd even consider something of that nature is if we knew that America was with us and that if Iran somehow became active in, in a military way in the West Bank, that America would always stand with Israel. And so because of the lack of confidence in our commitment, even the Israelis wanted to pull back a bit from the negotiating table. The, the consequence of not understanding negotiations has been extraordinarily difficult. And this president, I think, in part, has said, I'm, um, I'm so anxious to retreat from the policies of the prior administration that he didn't realize he was also retreating from the policies of Truman and Kennedy and Eisenhower and Nixon and Reagan. And this nation needs those policies and our commitment to freedom and strength <laughs> and to our allies. Now, I think most Americans recognize that the president's missteps on domestic policy have just as, has been just as consequential. And, and uh, uh, I recognize, as you do, that when he came into office, he did not create the financial crisis. It was already underway, and things were getting worse. And, uh, and I fault him for a number of things. Number one, uh, some of you have been in the, in the business world. Can, can I see by a show of hands all the people in this room who have been in business or are in business? Yeah, that's what I thought. All right. Okay. So more, more than all the people in the room are in business, right? And, uh, and so he, he, has, uh, he, he came into a setting where you as business people recognize that if you've got an enterprise in trouble, if you've got a business that's, that's falling apart, there are, there are three rules for turnaround. Focus, focus, and focus. Find out what's critical and focus on it. What was critical as he came into office was the economy. And what he did instead of focusing on it was delegating it to Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid. And they put together a $787 billion, almost a trillion dollar borrowing and spending program. And instead of creating incentives for the private sector to buy capital goods and to hire people, they instead sent money out to states to protect state workers. And that money lasted about a couple of years. And now the states are having to pay the pipers. They take that on. Finally, the one sector we could have afforded to shrink was the governmental sector. But instead of promoting the private sector, he protected the governmental sector. And as a result, that stimulus was a lot of money borrowed and a lot of money spent with very little return. And then he focused on what he really cared about, his own liberal agenda. First of all, we're going to have cap and trade. We're going to disparage oil, gas, coal, nuclear. We're going we're to pursue uh, a, a policy of making energy costs much higher. 
And, and then we're going to have card check. We're going to push card check, the idea that we'll unionize every business in America, whether or not their employees want it. And then, of course, there was Obamacare. We're going to have the federal government take over from the states the responsibility for care for the poor in their states. And, uh, and the list goes on of his agenda. Uh, there was, of course, Dodd-Frank, the bill that, that re-regulated the, uh, the financial industry, uh, 2,000 pages, regulations yet to be written. And then there was just the concept of massive deficits, as far as the eye could see. You know, in the, in the business world, we can deal with bad news. Those of you who've been in business know that if the government does something bad, you, you can deal with it. It can be painful, but you can deal with it. The one thing you can't deal with is uncertainty. If you don't know what's going to happen down the road, you can't take action. So cap and trade, to those that are in energy intensive industries, they didn't know what their costs were going to be. So they pulled back, given the uncertainty. And card check, people who hire a lot of folks didn't know what the cost of labor was going to be, so they pulled back. And Obamacare, if you're in the one-fifth of the economy, almost, it's health care, you didn't know what the future was going to be, so you pulled back. At the very time, we wanted entrepreneurs and innovators and small business to be stepping forward and growing, they became more uncertain and pulled back. And as a result, this president has caused the deepening and the lengthening of this recession, this downturn. Just, just yesterday, I was here in... Uh, in, in Las Vegas and uh, went by the uh, home, uh, David and, uh, and Kathy Tyler's home. They live in North Las Vegas. Their, uh, their home is in a neighborhood with a high level of foreclosures. We walked around and looked at the foreclosures. And uh, I'll tell you, it just breaks your heart. Uh, un unemployment is not a statistic. Uh, unemployment is, is real pain and sorrow in the lives of a lot of people. And, and interestingly, not just those that are unemployed. As I, as I was at the Tyler's home and you see empty homes in their community. One, one home, for instance, the yard is all messed and the, the garage door is on a cant and it's clear that people are, are, uh, are sleeping in there, in, in this abandoned house. I mean, unemployment hurts the entire community, even those that are, that are employed. And, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was astonished by the fact that at a time when, when Nevada was in trouble and Nevada's unemployment rate was going up, it's, Nevada has had the highest unemployment for 10 straight months at over 13%. This president disparaged Las Vegas and Nevada time and again. Businesses were afraid to come here for company meetings because they thought they might get singled out. Contrast that with what Rudy Giuliani did when New York got in trouble. He said, come to New York City. We need your help. Well, the president's going to be here in a couple of weeks. Let's hope he comes to Las Vegas, Nevada, and does a Rudy Giuliani and invites Americans back to Nevada. Now, I saw this was a room full of uh, business people. I don't think the, the president likes you a lot. <laughs> I, uh, I say that a bit tongue-in-cheek, of course. But uh, when he put his cabinet together, he, he didn't select a lot of business people to be there, if any. Uh, I, I think he sees business as a necessary evil, and maybe not even necessary in his point of view. I, I like what you do. I, I recognize that every good job we're going to create with high incomes and permanence is going to come from the private sector. I, I love entrepreneurs and innovators and creators. It's what makes our economy the most robust economy in the world. I, uh, I wonder how it is the president could be so misguided. And I think part of it comes from a perception that Europe got it right and that we got it wrong. Because like the Europeans, when things got in trouble here, he decided to borrow more money, spend more money, and build greater and greater debts. Like the Europeans, he's disparaging of fossil fuels and is anxious to put in place a cap-and-trade system. Like the Europeans, he wants to see unions even where the employees don't want them. Like the Europeans, he's going to forecast deficits as far as the eye can see. I believe in America. I believe that we got it right. I believe the American experiment worked. I believe that what's happening in Europe isn't working there and sure as heck wouldn't work here. I believe... I believe in free enterprise. I believe in capitalism. My goodness, I believe in freedom and opportunity. When the founders came together and wrote the founding documents of this country, they not only made a choice to allow us as citizens to choose our elected representatives, but they also allowed us to choose the life we would live. This became the land of opportunity on the entire planet. Every person, every pioneer, every innovator, every creator, every person seeking freedom wanted to come here. That's what made America what America is. 
I love the opportunity and the freedom that is America. Washington is trying to smother that with regulation and taxes and a greater and greater reach to the federal government. They're wrong. I believe in America. I believe that we stand by our allies. We stand by our friends. I believe in strength. I believe in a strong military and strong commitment to the principles that keep us the hope of the earth. Now this... I, uh, I just wanted to, to close with a couple of thoughts and then turn to your questions. Um, I think we're at a very unique point of time in American history. I think there is a recognition on the part of the American people that something is really, really wrong with our government. And I, and I say that because for years, even when my dad ran for office back in the 1960s, uh, 1962, we used to talk about deficits and too much spending and frankly, that was a message that, that struck home with our base, but it was not something that independents or Democrats warmed to. And I've seen polls over the decades of what are the biggest issues that Americans are concerned about, and frankly, our national debt rarely makes it to the top five. That's different today. The massive spending and excessive debt in this country is now either number one or number two. It's the economy and our debt. That's a good thing. It, it means that the American people are, are focusing on something that's got to be dealt with. For Pete's sakes, when, when the Washington Post a few weeks ago criticizes President Obama for not proposing any reforms to Social Security, you know something's happening in America. This, this, is a, this is a paper whose editorial board, I presume, is pretty darn liberal. And, uh, and they're saying something's got to change. And my experience in this country is that when our people hear the truth and are called upon to take bold action, Americans will rise to the occasion. We are a very patriotic people. I, uh, I br I've had that brought home to me so many times. I, it's, it's extraordinary. I, I, you know, I, when I was helping run the Olympic Games in Salt Lake City a number of years ago, I noted that our athletes, when they were on the podium and received the gold medal and the national anthem was played, our athletes put their hand over their heart. And, and I didn't see any other nation do that. And I asked whether this was true, whether other, other nations do that. Apparently not. I don't know the exact derivation of that. I was told the other day that, that this practice began uh, during the years of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in, in recognition of the blood shed by the heroes who were fighting for our liberty. We would place our hands over our hearts. We are a patriotic people. As I place my hand over my heart as the national anthem is played, I think about that blood that was sacrificed by our sons and daughters, by noble families in the past and today. The American people rise to the occasion as long as they're told the truth and are given a pathway. And we in this room have every opportunity to share the truth with people, to explain to them that we believe in America, that we got it right, that free enterprise, that freedom, that opportunity, that strength, that standing with our friends, that American values are right and true and the only way to preserve peace on the earth and to keep the American dream alive is for us to come together, communicate to our, to, that to our friends, and sacrifice for the greater good of the greatest nation on earth. And I, uh, I know there are some who would apologize for America. I find that a strange thing. Because our free enterprise system, by the way, our free enterprise system, now being picked up by places like China and, and India and parts of Africa, has helped left, lift billions of people out of poverty. Lifting people, nothing else like it in the history of the earth like what we have championed and pioneered, lifting people out of poverty. And then, of course, the, the blood of our sons and daughters have shared liberty around the world. This is a great nation with a great purpose, and what you're doing here makes an enormous difference. Let's work together so that we can make sure that we remain, as we have always been, the hope of the earth. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's uh Thank you. I see a hand up already. Ambassador Sembler. Mommy is here. Would you mind introducing Would, Can I have my uh, I have to tell you a bit about this young lady here. Come on up here. I recognized
I recognized almost everybody in the audience that was important, except the person who's most important to me, my, uh, my dear wife, Anne. She is a... Uh, I'm going to say something first. Um, she's quite a champion. She's quite a champion. She was, uh, she was diagnosed in 1998 with multiple sclerosis and has uh, gone to work to overcome that and be able to be uh, uh, fully physically able to do whatever is required in her life. Uh, and then a couple of years ago was diagnosed with breast cancer. She is a fighter. She's my hero. Mother of our five sons and 16 grandkids. And let's say hello. You know, my, my heart really warms to, um, to recognize so many people in this audience that we know and love and have been um, good friends of ours. And also to recognize um, what a wonderful thing it is to belong and to feel as though your identity, your Jewish identity, is something that you work for and love and cherish. Um, Mitt and I can appreciate that, having come from another religious heritage as well, because that gives you such a grounding and such a um, sense of peace um, and such a sense of family and dedication, too, that um, we pass on from generation to generation. So I honor that as well and appreciate that. Um, I, as I was sitting in the audience, I, I've heard Mitt speak a few times, as you might imagine. <laughs> Um, and uh, how can I still um, be moved by things that he says? That's quite amazing, too. But um, I really was moved by his, by his thoughts about freedom and about this country. And um, I have a prediction that if he does decide to go forward, that he will be an absolutely extraordinary president, be an absolutely extraordinary president of this country. <laughs> absolutely extraordinary president of this country.